I want to tell you five things about the oceans that might surprise you. I'm not going to tell you about vampire squid or whale communication or rogue waves, as amazing as those things are. I'm going to tell you about something I find equally amazing, and that is ocean history. So the first thing that might surprise you is that oceans have histories. Think of all the history classes you've ever taken. Oceans often appear as stages for events, but rarely are they at the center. In other words, history has a terrestrial bias. And I've spent my career trying to change that, and I want you to think of oceans as places with histories. The second thing is that ocean history is a long story. People in oceans have interacted over evolutionary time. Different cultures have distinct relationships with their oceans. Those relationships have changed over time, and they deserve attention. Using the example of the Western relationship with the undersea in particular, I'm going to tell you a few more things that might surprise you. So today, aquariums and photography make the undersea a common viewpoint, but that hasn't always been the case. Images of the undersea, though, are terrific for helping us see past relationships between people and oceans. This is an illustration from a medieval retelling of the story of Alexander the Great visiting the deep sea floor in a diving bell, supposedly. He had just conquered the Persian Empire to create the world's largest empire to date, and his motive for going undersea was assumed to be curiosity and also a determination to conquer the sea as well as the land. So the third thing that might surprise you is that visualizing the undersea also has a history. Images depicting the undersea come from direct bodily experience for shallow waters, but beyond that, they come from indirect experiences involving technologies and skills. So yesterday's sounding lines and hand-drawn charts have become today's autonomous vehicles beaming back data. The indirect nature of our knowledge about oceans means that imagination and media and aesthetics loom large. Another way to say this is that we know oceans through a combination of work, including scientific work, and imagination. And the verb fathoming explains this well. So technically speaking, a fathom is a unit of measure that uses the human body for scale. One fathom is six feet, or the average arm span of an adult man which enabled navigators to sound or measure depth by counting one fathom of line at a time. As a unit of measure, fathom evokes kind of science and technology, but as you know, fathom has another meaning as well. It means the act of trying to understand a difficult problem after much thought, and that fathom invokes imagination. I'm going to show you a few pictures from the mid-19th century and a few more from the post-World War II period to illustrate how important imagination has been for our knowing and using the oceans. And we'll get to those other things that might surprise you along the way. This is an illustration of Devonian-era creatures frolicking underwater, and it offered a novel perspective two decades before aquariums were invented. Aquariums became both a popular craze and a tool for scientists. Marine naturalists at this time did not themselves go underwater. They modified oyster dredges to capture specimens and through their work created an understanding of marine life and undersea space. This cartoon by a naturalist which shows marine creatures deciding what did and did not go into the dredge, suggests this cartoonist's sense of the limits of his knowledge. Scientists developed a, a growing consciousness of the volumetric ocean, which then extended to a wider public. Images of the undersea began to appear in newspapers and magazines, on sheet music for parlor pianos, and in illustrated fiction, such as the much-loved edition of Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, illustrated by Edouard Roux. 
Attempts to lay a transatlantic telegraph cable attracted media attention, and readers grew fascinated with undersea depictions associated with that. It was explorations in advance of the first cable laying attempt that inspired this unique visualization. Created by Edward Moran, the valley in the sea depicts the Atlantic seafloor as a landscape in the style of a group of early American landscape painters known as the Hudson River School. This image shows scientific understanding of ocean basins as sloping regularly toward a flat bottom. Romantic images of this period often evoked drama and movement, but this image is still reflecting the view that the deep sea was free from currents and therefore safe for cables. Like the Moran painting, this sketch of the so-called telegraph plateau was based equally on actual deep sea measurements and wishful thinking. The discoverer of the plateau claimed that it seemed to have been placed there especially for the purpose of holding the telegraph wires and keeping them out of harm's way. That sounds like wishful thinking to me. <laughs> the cable's actual eventual success seemed to confirm the plateau's existence and yet a decade or so later, the Mid-Ocean Ridge was discovered right in the middle. The completion of the 1866 cable inspired this celebratory print with Neptune guarding the cable in his depths. The British Lion and the American Eagle watched the steamer Great Eastern, which was the only vessel in the world large enough to carry the entire length of cable. This allegory projects the pride of both of these nations at this great technological accomplishment and also conveys confidence that the great ocean has bent to human will. So you might be surprised to learn that the first global scale human built infrastructure installed in oceans were those very cables. By 1902, cables spanned the globe with the all red line linking the British Empire. Today, fiber optic cables carry virtually all transoceanic digital communications. Unlike in the 19th century, cables rarely make front page news. And their invisibility, I think, reflects our more general failure to recognize the extent to which oceans became important sites of industrialization and capitalism in the last 200 years, which might surprise you. Fast forwarding to the post-World War II period, the obsession for the undersea at that time dwarfed 19th century fascination. It even often eclipsed enthusiasm for outer space. As in the 19th century, visual media played a key role, starting with Jacques Cousteau's famous films and including a 1954 movie version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Glimpses into the undersea were enabled by the new technology of scuba. This illustration of an anticipated entirely underwater oil industry, from drilling to refining to storage to transport, suggests the scale of ambition for oceans. This is quite obviously an optimistic image full of technological enthusiasm. Less obvious are the dystopian fears for disappearing resources in the context of global overpopulation. Futuristic visions like this did not fulfill their extravagant promise, but the appeal of wealth from the sea did powerfully shape today's law of the sea. And dreams of deep sea mining have revived, renewing along with them geopolitical conflicts and sparking off clashes between conservationists and capitalists. So the fifth and final thing that might surprise you is that solving ocean challenges related to climate change will depend on ocean histories. Decisions will hinge on our vision of the undersea. Is it a treasure chest, a blank slate for mastery, a cornucopia of materials needed for survival, or maybe a home for species with whom we share the planet? Embedded in each one of those visions are assumptions and decisions from the past that will shape future possibilities. I hope that you will look for and share ocean histories. They are everywhere and they're important. Thank you. Thank you.